everybody happy valentine's day happy snow day it's good to um not see you but know you're out there worshiping with us this next song i think is absolutely perfect for today it's called god so loved which i can't think of a better um valentine greeting or um just thing to know and remember and feel every day of our lives i 
One more song for you this morning. This is an old song about words that are even older, but always relevant and always um, important, always something to hold on to and to believe in and to trust in. This song's called Ancient Words. <laughs> Of life, 
sacrifice, O oh, ye the faithful words of Christ. Holy word, long preserved for our walk in this world, in resound with God. Thank you, Lord, that um, just for another Sunday, God, that we get to worship you, uh, Lord, and even though we can't be together today, God, in person, um, that we still have this opportunity through technology just to worship you together as a church, God, in communion. Um, I pray, Lord, that you will be with Jimmy and Jazil with the message today, Lord, just uh, just fill us all with your spirit, Lord, wherever we may, have, wherever we may be, Lord, um, just speak through Jim, God, and that you'll just bless the rest of this, bless the rest of our time together. I thank you for all this, Lord, and I pray this all in your holy name. Amen. Good morning, Faith Fellowship Church, and welcome back to our series in Acts that we are calling Acts, the birth of the church. I have to stop and say, it would have been so good, and I was so looking forward to being in person after three weeks of not seeing everyone. Amen? I have a Catholic background, at least until the age of 12, and I was looking forward <laughs> to being able to say, bless me, Father. It's been, I, I have sinned, it's been three weeks since I was last in church. I guess I'll have to wait for a fourth week. I miss it. I don't know how people live without it. Well, I read that an old English periodical published a letter written by a disillusioned churchgoer. The letter went like this. Dear sirs, it seems ministers feel their sermons are very important and spend a great deal of time preparing them. I have been attending church quite regularly for 30 years and have probably heard 3,000 of them. His math doesn't add up, by the way, at one a week. To my consternation, I discovered I cannot remember a single sermon. I wonder if a minister's time might be more profitably spent on something else. Now, here is someone I can safely say does not have the gift of encouragement. Oh, my. Over the next several weeks, a firestorm of responses came on both sides of the aisle. But then came this one response that ended it all. It went like this. Dear sirs, I have been married for 30 years. During that time, I have eaten 32,858 meals at one a day or three times a day. His numbers do add up. Don't forget leap year. Mostly my wife's cooking. Suddenly I have discovered I cannot remember the menu of a single meal. And yet I have the distinct impression that without them, I would have starved to death long ago. Amen. <laughs> like food is to maintaining our overall physical health, so is the word of God to maintaining our spiritual health. In Satan's temptation in the wilderness, Jesus said this, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so what I have found is that our attitude toward God's word and how we approach it, that determines his effectiveness in our lives. FFC, the teaching team, is committed each week to faithfully open God's word and to share it with you. And we want to remind you, 
If you missed a message, any message of the year, you want to catch up, you want to listen to one again, you can do so by going online to ffcsermon or sermons.org, where you can do just that. You can even listen via podcast. You can also go to www.ffcph.org, click on the live tab, and watch a previous message on YouTube or Facebook. We'll be looking at Acts chapter 17 today. Let's pray and see what God has for us. Father, we come into your presence. We thank you for your word, that it is so rich, that it is so full of instruction for us, that it is full of your presence from beginning to end. And we thank you that you share your life with us, that you are not a distant God, but that you are intimately involved in our lives and want to be. We thank you that we can call you Father. We ask for your presence as we open your word this morning. We do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. Acts chapter 17 already. We are little more than halfway through this 28-chapter journey, looking at the birth of the church. In Luke's book, The Acts of the Apostles. Now, if you're just joining this series, let me catch you up. This is Luke's second book of his two unified book uh, work. We know this from the introduction of his second book, this book that we're looking at now, Acts, in Acts chapter 1, where Luke says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles, he had chosen. His first volume was his gospel, where he did exactly that. He wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach, which leads to a really interesting point about the book's traditional but not original name, the Acts of the Apostles. The title Acts of the Apostles was first used by Irenaeus in the late second century. And while apostles do appear throughout most of the book, different apostles, the only single character who unifies the whole work from beginning to end is Jesus himself, either acting directly or through the Spirit. And so the book would have been more accurately named the Acts of Jesus and the Spirit. This book's introduction recounts how the risen Jesus spent some 40 days with his disciples, teaching them about the kingdom of God. This connects back to all the Gospels, where Jesus claimed that he was restoring God's kingdom over the world, beginning with Israel. So he called Israel to live under God's reign by following him. They kind of blew that, and his call was extended to everyone. And he was enthroned as king when he gave his life, and then conquered death with his love and resurrection. And so the book of Acts begins with the risen King Jesus instructing his disciples about life in his kingdom. He promised that the Spirit would soon come and immerse them in his personal presence. This fulfilled one of the key hopes from the Old Testament prophets, that in the Messianic kingdom, God's presence, his Spirit, would come and take up residence among his people in a new temple, their transformed hearts. And so Jesus says, when this happens, that the Spirit will empower his disciples to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so the main themes and the design of the book of Acts flow right out of the opening chapter. The rest of the book is about Jesus leading his people by the Spirit to go out into the world and to invite all nations to live under his reign. And so the story began with that message spreading in Jerusalem, and then into the neighboring regions of Judea and Samaria, and then to areas full of non-Jewish people, and then from there out to all the nations and to the ends of the earth. That's still happening today through you and I, at least it is supposed to be. Now, as I read the book of Acts, I would say no one has come close to matching the the evangelistic tenacity and versatility of the Apostle Paul. He is able to hold his ground in a wide range of contexts, as we will see in this text, and preach the gospel. He reminds me a little of Pat Venditti. Now, Pat Venditti is a free agent pitcher in the major leagues of baseball, in the major league baseball. There's nothing special about that, except that Venditti is a switch pitcher. He throws both left-handed and right-handed. And while we've had switch hitters for years in baseball, he is one of only two or three to ever play in the majors. In 2019, the Giants were looking for both a right-handed and a left-handed relief pitcher in the offseason. 
And when Venditti became available, they said, we'll just take him. One sports reporter describing Venditti got so excited that he declared Venditti was an, an amphibious pitcher. <laughs> wow, he could pitch on water and on land. I think he meant ambidextrous. Like Venditti, Paul was an ambidextrous evangelist. He was able to throw these gospel strikes in the synagogues to the Jews. He was able to go into the marketplace and preach and into the places of the, places of the philosophers and also engage them faithfully and effectively. Paul's own attitude was that he, was op, that he had an obligation to fulfill. In Paul's letter to the church in Rome, he says he had an obligation to both Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish, to present the gospel. In his letter to the Corinthians, he says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Maybe you learn from him this morning. That's what I want to do this morning, learn from Paul's example. While in the latter half of Acts 17, preaching is, uh, well, in that latter half of Acts 17, preaching is exactly what we find Paul doing. In the first half of Acts 17, Paul was in both Thessalonica and Berea sharing the good news, the gospel, with Jews. He got run out of both of those cities by the Pharisees and by some troublemakers and is evacuated to the city of Athens. Now, he is supposed to be waiting for Timothy and Silas, but Paul is, Paul is not one to just sit around. So let's begin reading at verse 16 of Acts 17. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. So let's stop right there. Now Athens was and is a place with great history. Famous playwrights, historians, musical geniuses, philosophers, artists, sculptors, all once called Athens home. And in Paul's day, although the, the golden age of Athens, which was the 5th century BC, had come and gone, it was still a beautiful, influential, and intellectual city. And in every Greek city, the highest point of elevation housed a temple to some god or goddess, the patron god of the city. These were the high points in the city. Uh, Acropolis means a, a, a high city. And at the top of this high city, the highest point of elevation would be a temple to a god or goddess. And Athens was no different. The great goddess Athena stood inside the Parthenon, goddess of wisdom, war, and crafts. And about 50 yards away from the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, um, the Pantheon was the, a little hill. And on this little hill stood another temple to the Greek god of war, Ares, which corresponds to the Roman god of war, Mars. And so the name Areopagus or Mars Hill. Now, as we think about Paul in Athens, what I want you to do this morning is to think with me about what Paul saw, about what Paul felt, about where Paul went, and about what Paul said. So what he saw, what he felt, where he went, and what he said. So when it comes to the issues we face in fulfilling our mission of taking the good news to the world, Paul was also dealing with the same issues. How do we engage a religious, a, a pluralistic, a skeptical society, a secular society? How do we engage intellectual yet biblically illiterate people who are all around our area? Well, where does Paul go and what does he see, feel, and say? Well, Paul was waiting for them, Timothy and Silas, having been run out of Berea and Thessalonica back in the first part of this chapter. But Paul was not one to sit around. Granted, Paul is not on like a planned mission trip. Humanly speaking, Paul wasn't planning on going to Athens at all. But Paul is not only a missionary when he's on a missionary trip. He is always a missionary. So are you and I. And so he's in Athens, and he's just waiting on his pals to join him in Athens. And what gets his attention, what he sees in Athens at first, is not the beauty of the city. It's not the tourist attractions. It's the idols of the city. That is what he sees. Petronius, a contemporary writer in Nero's court, satirically said it was easier to find a god in Athens than a man. There were idols literally everywhere. The market was lined with idols. It could even be translated as smothered in idols. That's the way I like my pancakes, smothered in butter and pure maple syrup. 
Well, the, the, the city was smothered with idols. Kind of sounds like Las Vegas to me. Never been there. But Paul viewed the city differently than a typical tourist views the city of Athens. Because Paul looks at the city with a redeemed set of eyes. Eyes that have seen the risen Savior and seen truth and been changed by them. This is very important for us to remember. When we become a Christian, you get a whole new set of eyes when you become a Christian. Eyes that see clearly. Eyes that have a different worldview. You and I wear different glasses than the rest of the world. We may enjoy the same things that the world enjoys, but we enjoy them differently. We see them differently. We hear them differently. We understand the purposes underneath of them. We can enjoy the arts, but the view that we have of the arts is through believing eyes. We can enjoy music, but we listen to it differently. We think about sports and can enjoy it, but we think about it differently. We see the world in light of God's revelation. We see it in view of what he has revealed about himself, about his son, about the story of the Bible. We view the world in light of creation, fall, redemption, and new creation. That's the gospel story. And so we can't go around and not see things and feel a certain way. We just don't live this life and see things the same way that a non-Christian does. We worship the God of revelation, not the God of our imagination. And because he has revealed himself and revealed his ways to us, it affects us literally in everything that we do, in everything that we see, in everything that we say, in everywhere we go. It changes your worldview. It fixes your worldview. Jonathan said last week that a right Christian worldview leads to worship of the Creator. So how do we see the world around us? Do we see idolatry like Paul? We may not see cities immersed in idols in the United States, but idolatry is present everywhere. G.K. Chesterton said, when men choose not to believe in God, they do not thereafter believe in nothing. They then become capable of believing in anything. Because we are, as Freud said, incurably religious. Why? Because we are looking for something to believe in. We are looking for the truth. I think John Lennon said it best when he said, I'm sick and tired of hearing things from uptight, short-sighted, narrow-minded hypocrites. All I want is the truth. Just give me some truth. I've had enough of reading things by neurotic, psychotic, pig-headed, Politicians, he'd do well today. All I want is the truth. Just give me some truth. You see, in the absence of truth, people will believe in anything and think they have it all figured out. Paul's reaction is to go out into the streets and to all talk to anyone who would listen. In the church I grew up in, there was a man named Andre. He lived in New York, and he rode to the metro to work every day. People would stop him and ask him if he had a light, if a cigarette. And he would say, sure, and he'd pull him aside. And then when he got him aside, he'd pull out his New Testament, always carried a New Testament. And he'd say, I got Jesus. He's the light, the light of the world. And he would just start evangelizing. Somebody asked him once if he had any drugs, if he had the good stuff. He said, oh, yeah, I got the real good stuff. Come on over here. Pulled out the New Testament, said, I got the best stuff, and went right into talking about Jesus. He won a lot of people to the Savior. He could have been like, dude, I'll stay in my lane, you stay in yours. You live your life, I'll live mine. You believe what you believe, I'll believe what I believe. But he engaged the people around him. Paul was the same way. He was both angered by what he saw and moved for them. You could tell by the way that Paul interacts with the Athenians, that he also shared a certain love for them, a brokenhearted compassion for people that need the truth of the gospel. Paul warmly and respectfully engages the Athenians. He doesn't take a sledgehammer to their idols. <clears throat> he knew it requires patience and grace and love to reach people. I would argue we need to not only have the theology of Paul, we need to have his heart as well. We need to feel, if you will, like Paul. But he's also not afraid to boldly share the truth either, as we will see in the next chapter. We've seen what Paul saw and what he felt. Now let's take a look at where he went and what he said. Starting in verse 18 of our chapter, Acts 17, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. 
They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They took him, they then took him and brought him to a meeting of the Aragopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. Mm -hmm. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul is confronted by these Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, and he went with them for the opportunity to share the gospel. And because he went with them, he got that opportunity. Who were these people? What did they believe? Well, the Epicureans, they sought pleasure over pain as a philosophy. If he couldn't feel it, see it, touch it, smell it, or taste it, it wasn't real. From his worldview, when I'm dead, I'm dead. If God exists, he has no interest in me at all. The Stoics, on the other hand, sought self-control in order to master self to the point of denial of self-pleasure. Complete self-sufficiency was the goal. There is no afterlife. There is no God other than an impersonal nature and a quasi-rational force. Love was at best suspect and toxic to self-sufficiency. In some aspects, those two worldviews are like polar opposites. But for Paul and the early Christians, the ethic of love was everything. These Athenians prided themselves as being spiritually rich because they knew every religion and philosophical view that came along, that was espoused by anyone who happened to come along. Well, when what they really were was a Jaden. A Jaden? Who's Jaden? Oh, you don't know Jaden? Well, let me introduce you to Jaden. Jaden is a boy who has one dollar, one quarter, and two pennies and thinks He's all that. Listen to see what Jaden truly is. Jaden has one dollar bill, one quarter, and two pennies. How how much money how much money does he have? Jaden broke. <laughs> Let's listen to that again, because it's too, it's too funny not to. Jaden has one dollar bill. One quarter and two pennies. How how much money how much money does he have? Jaden broke. <laughs> they were spiritually broke like Jaden and they didn't know it. They thought they had it all figured out. They thought they could handle this babbler, but they were messing with forces beyond what they knew. They were messing with far more than a babbler. Paul was nothing compared to the message, however, and he would tell you that. Paul in Romans 1 says this, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. That's what idols are. All the same, that a hint, because they had a monument in this great place, Mars Hill, the Aragopagus, to an unknown God. And Paul is going to fill them in on what they missed. They actually brought Paul, this babbler as they called him, there to make fun of him, to poke holes in his word view. But just the world view, but just the opposite happens. As a group of people who had no defining single world view, they were tossed back and forth by every wind of doctrine, by every new world view that came along. Look, everyone has a worldview. It's what you believe in. And your view affects every decision that you make. What's yours? Does it measure up to the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ? Whatever your worldview is, it has to address four necessary questions. Your world has to address origin, meaning, morality, and hope that assures a destiny. Where did I come from? Why am I here? What is right and wrong? What hope do I look forward to after I die? And the questions, the answers to those questions must pass three tests. They must be empirically adequate, logically consistent, and experientially or existentially relevant. They gotta matter. I contend that only the good news of Jesus Christ is found in the Bible, fits, and can be found to answer those questions and pass those tests. Paul lays out his message in the most compelling fashion in the rest of this chapter. 
We've seen what he saw and felt and where he went. Now let's take a look at what he said. Notice how he begins, verse 22 of Acts 17. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Aragopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you were very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. Why, why is Paul so gracious to those whom he knew only wanted to poke fun at him? Well, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus is sending out his disciples, and he says this to them. In uh, Matthew's gospel, he says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. Sounds like what Paul's going through. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. For it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Paul wasn't delivering his own words. He didn't have to worry about that. The spirit of God would speak through him. Knowing the truth of the gospel allowed Paul to declare in Romans uh, in Romans that uh, 116, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation and to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Perfect love, John says, cast out all fear. Paul goes on, and I want to read the rest of this chapter because the words that Paul uses were inspired and are far better than anything that I can add. Well, he starts off with a clear definition of origin and a personal God. Verse 24, he says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needs anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. Paul says, let me tell you, about a God who's not unknowable, who can actually be known. And so he begins in 24 with creation. He says in 24 that the God who made the world and everything in it. Now right there, that flew in the face of these Greek philosophers and the people to whom he was speaking because there was, they believed that there was a God over this, and a God over that, and another God over this thing and over that thing. And no one God literally made everything. Everything today, in fact, might say made in China. You can even buy an American flag that says, made in China. Probably get even worse in this administration. But you and everything in the world has an even more important standpoint. Made by God. Paul begins with the creation. And he says that you can't confine the creator to a temple like the gods of the Greeks and Romans. Being Lord of heaven and earth, he does not live in a temple made by man. I can imagine Paul pointing around going, here's a temple, there's a temple. Everywhere a temple, temple. Old McDonald's had a farm, right? You can't cage up the creator. Why? Because he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. Paul hits them again because in contrast to much Greek thought and these philosophers, God is very, very much involved in his creation. He's not served by humans' hands as though he's needed anything. Uh, you know, you can imagine God going, uh, yeah, I got a little dirt on my statue here. Can't reach that spot. Can you get it for me? <laughs> I don't think that's happening. That's a humbling word, though, isn't it? That he doesn't need us, but we need him. And he chose to use us because he loves us. John, in his first epistle, says, he who does not he who does not love does not know God, for God is love, 1 John 4, 8. This must have drove the Stoics crazy. He cares about you and me. He marked out their appointed times and the boundaries of their lands. We serve a God who takes a personal, intimate interest in us, in our lives, in what's going on in them. Now, I want you to do an exercise with me. This would have been more impactful if we were all together, but I think we can still do this at home. I want you to do an exercise with me. Uh, yeah, 
but we're, we're good. We can do it right from here. I want you to take a deep breath. And for 30 seconds, I'm going to pull up my clock if I can. For 30 seconds, we are going to hold our breath. Okay, we're going to hold our breath for 30 seconds. So I want you to take a deep breath. Ready? Go. Keep holding that breath. Bet you it's quiet where you are. <laughs> You're doing good. Almost halfway there. Almost halfway there. I bet you're starting to feel it though, aren't you? Starting to feel that longing for air. Almost there. A few seconds left. Five seconds to go. Six, seven, eight, nine. All right. You can breathe. You did it. That simple exercise is designed to reinforce the fact that you are a dependent creature. If there's no oxygen, you die. If there's a loss of the capability to breathe, you die. If your lungs give out, you die. You're dependent for every breath. You're finite. You're limited. You are not independent. You don't have life in yourself. We serve a God who doesn't need anything, and he's always on the job. Psalm 127 says that he does not sleep or slumber. So we have origin. Well, why does God do this? Verse 27 of our chapter. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And because God loves us, he wants an intimate relationship with us. This gives life meaning. I was created for something, for someone. I was created to be loved and to love. If life is random, as these philosophical, these philosophical uh, espousers did, these, these Stoics and these Epicureans, left to their quasi-rational and noble universe, if life is random, as they put forth, then first and foremost, there can be no ultimate meaning and purpose to existence. And in, as an individual and collectively as cultures, as a culture, we humans long for meaning. But if life is random, we have climbed the evolutionary ladder only to find that there is nothing at the top but a long, lonely, and depressing way down. We have meaning. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like a gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commends all people everywhere to repent. Paul says, guys, you got this backwards. We are his offspring, not the other way around. How foolish are those who manufacture idols, it says in Isaiah. These prized objects are really worthless. The people who worship idols don't know this, so they are all put to shame. Who but a fool would make his own God an idol that cannot help him one bit? Isaiah 44. It's a great chapter. I, I challenge you to read the whole chapter. Because the God of Christianity is a moral God, because he created all things. He has expressed in his creation his very character, and he passes morality on to us when he commands us to repent. If God was not moral, only cosmic dust, there would be no morality, and we would have no transcending value or worth. We would have no basis to claim right or wrong, and we cannot or could not say that the Hitlers and despots of this world were wrong in the choices and the actions that they made. Morality can't exist apart from a moral law giver. It simply falls apart. In a world in which matter only exists, as in the worldview of these philosophers, and many today, there can be no intrinsic worth. Let me give you an example. You may run into someone or you may know someone who you argue with or who would argue that there is no such thing as absolute truth. They will say there is no such thing as truth because they believe in nothing behind a truth that could give an absolute truth. But if that's true, then their very statement, the one they just absolutely insisted was true, is false. Oh, you mean, except your statement, everything else is, can't, is not true. But that statement's absolutely true. And the whole thing falls apart, and they are left speechless. 
we have morality. Continuing in our chapter, verse 31, Paul says, For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopolis, also a woman named Demarius, and a number of others. Because of the resurrection, we have destiny. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ must still be dead. And if he is still dead, then our preaching is useless. And you trust in a God who is empty, worthless, and hopeless. But if he did raise from the dead, then our faith is not in vain. And this really is good news. In 2017, we celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. At the heart of the celebration is Luther's insistence that we are saved by grace through faith and not by good works. But how exactly does faith save us? Well, some people think about it like this. God is angry because we're sinners, and God is obligated to punish us with eternal death, a.k.a. hell. But because God also loves us and doesn't want to punish us, he sent his son, Jesus, to die in our place. And if we believe the right things about Jesus, think about the Apostles' Creed, that God will forgive us and give us eternal life, a.k.a. heaven. In this scenario, faith is part of a transaction. Believe the right stuff and God will commute your death sentence. The technical name for this theological notion is penal substitutionary atonement theory, a phrase that is sure to make you an intellectual hit at your next dinner party. Well, I was just thinking about a penal substitutionary atonement theory, and everyone will pay great attention to you or walk away. I need a new drink. I used to think about faith that way. I don't any longer. Let me propose a different way to think about how faith saves us, and it's grace that saves us through faith. Jesus did not come into this world to change God's mind about us, but to change our minds about God. Like Adam and Eve, we live with the guilt and shame of our sin, hiding from God and hiding from one another. When we talk about being dead in sin, that's what we mean. There is a deadness that happens when we live in guilt and shame. Regardless of how much philosophy we have through it all, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection revealed the depth of God's love for us and for all that God has created. We are forgiven because God isn't keeping score to exact payment from us. If he were, there would be no hope. Nonetheless, make sure there is a score that has to be paid, has to be settled. Faith is daring to believe rather that we are so loved and forgiven as Jesus proclaims. Faith is trusting that God is at work, making us whole and new, all on his own, because he wants to give us grace. And he wants to give us his righteousness. This is the good news of the gospel. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I'll finish with this story. The Telegram of London wrote an article on February 14th of 2012 saying it's been a bad week for atheists. And one of the main reasons they did this was because Richard Dawkins, an espoused atheist, a rather famous espoused atheist, was on a radio program with Reverend Giles Frazier, the former canon of St. Paul's Cathedral. The Dawkins was making fun of Christians on that radio program, and he said that most Christians I know can't even name the first gospel, and <laughs> you call them Christians. And Canon Frazier just kind of took it all in stride, and he said, Richard, I guess you know the whole title of the book, The Origins of Species, do you? He said, uh, well, yeah, yeah, I do. He said, well, go ahead, tell the audience, what's the title? And Richard Dawkins started to to stumble and to bungle, and he muttered, oh my God, and you know what, he couldn't. And Frazier had to tell him what the title was. God, God has a sense of humor, and it's so ironic. God has to be omnipotent. When every, uh, even one who does not believe in him has to cry out to him for help to find 
and answer. Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. This is what the prophet Jeremiah says, Jeremiah 33.3. So you don't have to know that the title of that book is On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the uh, Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle of Life. Just know the one who originated it all. Find him, cry to him, and he will give you the answer to life. And not just the title of a book, but ultimately to the title of your very life and its meaning. Faith Fellowship, know that God is for you today and not against you. You can find him by seeking him. You can find him by calling out to him. God, I want to know you. Come into my life. I confess my sin. Come in and fill me with your presence. I want a worldview that gives me meaning and purpose and hope. Amen. Have a good day in Jesus.